my name is Suren Bagdasarian. I'll be uh, presenting uh, call site trampolines. And my co-presenters are Steven Rosted and uh, Alex Vetrov. Uh, so, let's see if it works. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. So um, uh, I'll present the call site trampolines ideas and um, current applications on implementation. And the goal of the talk basically is to gauge the interest of the compiler community for this feature, uh, explore some possible new applications for it, and also discuss the implementation details that we have. So first, the motivations. Uh, I was recently working on a memory allocation profiling feature, which the goal is basically to uh, account for every uh, allocated byte in the kernel. And that includes page allocations, lab allocations, per CPU allocations, VM allocs, and so on. So to do that, we naturally need to um, um, account for, uh, at the call sites, how much memory did we allocate? How many, how many times we allocated that location? And to, to do that, uh, we are instrumenting the allocators, which are quite a, a number of them in the kernel. Um, and um, so for that, we need to instrument our code at the allocation call site with some data which would represent how much memory was allocated and also to represent the location in the source code. Uh, of that call. So the location is generic data. We call it uh, a call tag, uh, which basically has file name, source file name, uh, line number, and um, module name. And uh, it, it is wrapped into the application-specific data. In our example, uh, memory profiling, it's basically how many bytes were allocated at that location and how many call sites happened at that location. Um, let's see, so uh, those, uh, that data uh, is injected at compile time, obviously, and it's placed into the array uh, so that we can easily iterate over them. Um, so they are allocated in a specific section. The question is, is it like, like called KMAP? Right, to yeah. This information, file line module. Right, so at every call to the KMALOC, we want to basically inject some small data structure which uh, which contains uh, information about that location plus counters like how many bytes we allocated and ultimately how many times we allocated at that location. Um, so, and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, allocations from the modules are also covered basically because we are um, instrumenting those allocators. See. So this is the memory allocation profiling is the biggest application right now, but we have also ex working examples of uh, dynamic fault injection. Basically, uh, we can at runtime we can specify which allocation we want to fail, so that we can test how we handle those failures. Uh, we can have uh, latency tracking. Basically, at, again at runtime we can specify which specific code paths we want to measure the latency for and error source tracking that's an interesting one so let's say if your function returns like e in val and there are several places where that code can be returned uh, by enabling this we can find out which exact code location actually generated that error and uh, the code tagging framework is actually generic enough as i said it's a code tag plus application specific structure which, which wraps it. So additional applications are very easy to implement once that uh, framework is in. Uh, I did post uh, the latest version just recently. There is a link in the presentation if anybody wants to look at the implementation that's like 39 patches. And this is what current implementation looks like. Um, it's, it, we are using macros basically to inject um, this code. And the macro takes um, allocation function as a parameter. So do alloc basically. It's a alloc hook is a macro which takes um, allocation as a uh, allocator as a parameter. Uh, define alloc tag here. I skip the details, but what it does basically it 
uh, defines a static uh, structure, which includes all that information, like code location and counters. It also stores a reference to that structure in the uh, current task structure, so that later on the actual allocator can increment those counters. And it also stores the current reference uh, into the old so that we can restore it later if there are nested calls to this function. Basically, we can uh, recover the previous uh, uh, alloc tag reference from the current task. The second line is basically calling the allocation uh, and the third one is restoring the old uh, pointer to the to the alloc tag. And this is how we instrument the actual allocator. So uh, kmalloc alloc node is the actual uh, Linux kernel, one of the, uh, the slab allocators. So we basically redefine it as a macro and we, um, we need to rename the original implementation and we wrap it into this um, macro, alloc hook macro. So this way, every time uh, Linux kernel calls uh, kmalloc alloc node, basically we inject static structure, uh, we implement this logic to store a reference to that structure, and when the allocation happens, we increment the counters and so on. Uh, there's also some uh, additional references so that we can, re um, free uh, during the free, we can decrement those counters, but uh, this is out outside of the scope of this talk. Um, so, uh, when I was upstreaming this, uh, it became obvious that in this instrumentation, macro-based instrumentation is quite invasive because we, again, Linux kernel has lots of alligators, especially slab allocations. Um, so, the uh, main concern was code pol pollution. Basically, lots of headers need to be changed. Um, lots of macros, which are not very readable. So, uh, a better way is needed basically. Uh, also, we have name collisions. So if, let's say, I redefine allo uh, page alloc, all alloc pages, for example, as a macro, then we have a structure like something ops, which has alloc pages, then a uh, preprocessor will change that in according to the macro and the compiler will not really like it. So we have all those issues. Um, so bottom line is upstream feedback is changes to something where much more uh, readable and easy, easier. Um, and here we go to the Steven. Steven's proposal to um, implement basically call, stack, call side trampolines. And I'll let Steven pr present that. So um, at LSFF MM, uh, when this was being proposed, there was the uh, MM uh, maintainers came to me and said, Steve, is there a way that we could do this like with like static calls? So um, a lot of people know me as being like loving to do strange things with the kernel that, you know, like modifying text and stuff like that, since I've been involved with almost every single thing that does like modification within the kernel at runtime. Um, so self-modifying code. And I sat down and I thought about the whole situation and I said, you know, if we had a way to at least say, where is every single call site of K Malik? So if I were to say, tell uh, GCC during the compilation, everything, uh, give me an address of this site uh, when it's called, we could then possibly change the call site to be like a jump or something. Uh, and also, it would be also great if we were able to say, hey, by the way, I want to automatically create a trampoline with maybe some C code. And it will create the trampoline as well that it will call to. But the funny part is uh, it might, well, if we use a jump, then we may have to play some more tricks because we may have to create a trampoline for every single call site as well, which is okay. We don't mind this code side. This will be compiled at time option. So the idea is this. Um, I will just face work. No, it doesn't. I have to go click the arrow here. Oh, oh that one does. Okay, so I should know this. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the idea is, let's say, um, one thing is, let's say we patched everything to change the calls to K Malik to a jump to a trampoline. So that K1 and K2. And then what would happen is it would then, well, it'd be like this. It would jump to K1. And then this trampoline would have the code tag before and after the call. So it does the beginning of the code tag, and inside the trampoline, it calls the actual K malloc. 
Then K. Pollock jumps back to the trampoline to do the ending part of it. And then it jumps back to the user. So if it's possible that we could have the compiler help us to do this, then um, everyone in the memory management loved this idea because it doesn't touch the current code. It's something that's added. And, and then we could also do this anything. It doesn't have to just be K Malik and manage, memory management. We could do this with the scheduler. We could do this with anything. So if we have this infrastructure, we could just say, okay, give me this function I want. And then I do the work on top of it and let everyone else figure out how to do that. But it's not, in, the goal is not to be intrusive to the subsystem that we're attaching to, where the other way with the macros is very intrusive. You have to change names of functions, you have to do that. And that was where everyone balked and they didn't want to do that. So I don't know that's, does that everyone understand the idea? Do you want to continue or? Yeah. And now Alexi will present implementation for Clang. Uh, so we have basically a working uh, proof of concept and Alexi, are you with us? Is it on? Is remote? Yeah, Alexei is joining from UK, so he will be. You have a chat there? Um, yes. Oh no. It looks like. But it's, it's pink. Right. Alexei, can you hear us? Okay, it looks like he can hear us, but we can't hear. Him. Yeah, uh, the chat is not working. Yeah. Okay. All right, one second. We're just trying to get his audio working well. Okay. Uh, yes. He's the presenter right now. He's the presenter, but he's not showing up as a bubble. So it's maybe on his end. Alexi, can you uh, say something? Let's check if we can yeah, hear you. Yeah, because he's, otherwise it would show up as well. It's not showing up as he's connected. What? It would show up as you walk in. It would show up up here as a bubble. Mm -hmm. His name would show up here. It will maximize this. So it just has to be in that way for the dentist. I thought it was a bit so the headphones if they're yeah. audio only, but he's got the mic. Yes, but it's not his microphone. It's it's not not he's in the chat and he's with the the watch and working on his yeah. speaking. Oh, that's why yeah, it's, it's, it's his side. He may have to try to. It's his side. It's on his side. It's on his side. That's oh. right. I can actually test real quick for mine. If you hear me, then you know it's just to show you. Okay, I think he's re reconnecting. I, oh. I tried to... Yeah, it looks like we can hear you now. Oh, yeah, finally. I just reloaded the window. <laughs> okay. okay, go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alex Simetrov, and I have implemented the proof of concept of the idea of call side trampolines in cloud. Or, as I call it, it's call side wrapper. On this slide, you can see a user check example for a new edit attributes to the compiler. First, you can see a wrapper definition, which starts with the call site wrapper uh, keyword. It's not an attribute, uh, but a keyword, and I will explain later why it's uh, so. And when compiler sees a keyword, uh, the whole function becomes a template with uh, some type and non-type uh, constants available. For example, and now uh, the wrapper have access to call site file, call site line, and now wrapper have access to the actual callee which you want to wrap, like uh, kmalloc. And uh, the wrapper has access to uh, arguments uh, and return type. Actually, you may notice uh, ellipses, uh, the three points, uh, which means that this argument is not just one argument, but maybe any number of arguments. And uh, the, the only change in the code of uh, MM will be adding this attribute near the function that we want to wrap. So this attribute is call site wrapped by, and the only argument it has is uh, uh, the wrapper. 
And because wrapper is a template, it can accept any coli, any number of arguments, any return type. So actually, you may use the one wrapper for uh, any number of functions. And what happens when you attach this attribute to the function you want to wrap? Uh, after that, a uh, compiler will replace all calls to the wrapped function to the wrapper instantiation. Uh, so actually, it will be not foo, but wrapper instantiated with foo as a, the, the callee argument. Even even more, you can get a, a pointer, you can get an address of this wrapper. Uh, in this example, you see foo pointer, and uh, it's equal to the point, it's equal to the pointer of foo, but actually it's not pointed to the foo, it's pointed to instantiation of the wrapper uh, at this exact point. So when you call foo pointer, it will still be monitored by the wrapper. The only difference that the line and file will be at the point where a pointer was created. So it will be a little bit, maybe a little bit off, but at least it, it is at least something uh, uh, that works for the pointer. The macros approach will not work for the pointer at all. Okay, uh, and also please uh, notice the static variable inside the wrapper. As Surin uh, said before, we use static variable to collect call side data, and actually this variable is allocated in the special uh, section of the ELF. Uh, and this section we can actually read from, uh, like uh, we, we can read uh, with any other function and uh, collect uh, call side data information. And uh, uh, the main, the important difference uh, for the call site wrapper is that it's template, and every template instantiation will have the static, the unique uh, static variable. Uh, let's imagine that this wrapper is not a template, and it just accepts an, an argument like file line uh, pointed to the function. If it was, if it is not a template, there will be only one static variable for each call site, and there will be no way to create uh, and allocate separate uh, static variable for each call site. So that is one of the reasons why templates are used. So let's move to the implementation details. As I said on the previous slide, a call site wrapper is, uh, transforms the function into a template. Uh, if we were in C++, it may look like this. Uh, so it has a lot of parameters, uh, and the first parameter is the callee. So it's basically the function foo, which will be wrapped, or any allocation or something else. Uh, these parameters is passed uh, to the template explicitly. And all other parameters are deduced from uh, either call site or from the call itself. For example, uh, arguments, uh, you, you may also notice the dot, dot, dot. Uh, it is actually a template pack that contains all the types of the all arguments. And you can use this uh, template pack in, <clears throat> in uh, arguments that pass into the wrapper. And using these arguments and the call, we uh, did use the type for return, like the return type. And also uh, uh, something like that, we may uh, deduce a line a function or any other call site uh, information. So uh, when you attach an attribute to a wrapped function, it just replaces your call to foo with a wrapper foo. So let's sum up why we are using templates and what are implications of this. The main reason is to have everything substituted in compile time. So everything is static and we don't spend any time doing it run time. Uh, we don't spend time for looking uh, for allocating uh, uh, place for uh, call site uh, wrappers. We don't spend time for looking for the uh, like for the structure to collect uh, for the 
structure for this exact uh, call side. Everything is in static. So the result in machine pool is actually very small. Uh, we know the address of the uh, static variable, and we just uh, increase the counter or uh, add uh, the number of bytes allocated. Uh, and the result will be very fast to execute. And uh, also, the uh, advantage of using the plates is that every instantiation of this template is addressable and you can take a pointer of it. So, a call side wrapper is able to call and to track calls through the pointers. And, uh, like I said before, every instantiation, every specialization of this template has its own scope for uh, any static variables that are inside of it. And these static variables are instantiated independently for each call site. Okay, templates are cool, but we are coding in C, right? No templates. And we also, uh, like in previous slide, I showed the usage of uh, ellipses or three dots uh, to forward all arguments past the wrapper to the wrapped function. However, uh, these three dots means different thing in C and C++. In C, it means variable arguments. So uh, uh, we want some solution that does not mess with C standard and that does not change parser or semantics too much. So, how exactly we introduced uh, templates into uh, C mode without breaking any everything? In fact, Clank internally has the same machinery for compiling C and C++ code. And the difference is hidden under multiple if cases, like the one in uh, and the end of the slide. Uh, in this case, let's check whether we are in C or C++ mode and enables or disable some parts of the code. So what we did is that when parser sees this call site wrapper keyword, uh, it does multiple things. First of all, it sets an internal flag on the declaration on the function of the wrapper uh, that uh, marks this wrapper like the, that this flag that can be accessed at any part of Clang pipeline. So when you have if uh, that uh, when you have block of the code that works on the principal path, you just add a new condition. Uh, so if this declaration is a call side wrapper, then we enable this chunk of code. And now we have uh, some C++ code enabled when we are parsing or generating code for uh, C. Also, this, um, this keyword creates a template parameter, like on the slides here, it creates this uh, thing with all the template parameters and adds these parameters to the declaration scope so they can be accessed. The, only in the declaration, not outside. Um, so uh, now uh, that we have a template, we need we just need to enable some C++ code. Um, but uh, like we wanted to enable only parts of C++ code because if you just enable C++ mode inside the function, you may find a lot of unexpected things. For example, uh, some user may try to instantiate a class or exception or something else. We don't want to blindly enable mm -hmm. all C++. So with this uh, thing, with this flag, we enable only parts that we need for templates to work. Okay, now we have a wrapper, which is template. Uh, how do we call it instead of a function? Every time a function is being called, there is a lookup stage uh, when we have a name of the function and we want to find an actual function uh, generated function node in the syntax tree. So we uh, changed a little bit uh, lookup code. And now when we look up a function that has this attribute uh, wrapped by, now when we find this function, we replace it with template instantiation of a wrapper with the parameter of the function. So when someone 
for example, point uh, address generation or call generation. Uh, sees a function that should be wrapped. It uh, finds instead of this function just a wrapper instantiated with the function. And now everything works uh, fine, but still there are few issues that we need to figure out. First of all, is uh, that we explicit we put explicitly only the function that is wrapped inside a template instantiation. But actually, we have a lot of other parameters like arguments, return type, and so on. And I lie to you on this slide. This fun this code will not work in C++ uh, because because of few issues. For example, you see call site line equal to built in line or equal to some macros uh, underscore underscore line underscore underscore. If you try to do it like this, it will just put the line where this code is located. Just put one line of the wrap, uh, the line of the location of the wrapper. But we need call side line and call side uh, file and call side function. So there is no such thing in C++ and we have to implement it ourselves. And the other thing is this return type. You cannot write this decal type in C++ because of this uh, template park, uh, template pack parameter. Like uh, this, this will not compile uh, and is not allowed in C++. So uh, the return type deduction is also made uh, manually. And so uh, we went to the code that uh, deduces parameters and uh, implemented extraction of call side information from uh, location of the like from the location of the call, uh, we also did use uh, return type uh, uh, manually, and the only uh, thing that is deduced automatically uh, by C++ code is the args themselves. They are deduced from arguments, and we need to do nothing for this to work. And the last problem left is name mangling. In C++, name mangling is used to separate names for overriding, overriding functions or for template instantiation. But in C, there is no such thing. There is no function override. There is no templates. So in C, name mangling is disabled unconditionally. But we can do the same thing as we did before. If we see a declaration with a, uh, with a wrapper uh, uh, flag, we just enable mangling for this declaration and all uh, static variables that contained inside. Uh, so, and after that, uh, we will uh, reap the benefits of using templates because uh, C++ already have this code implemented. C++ already can encode all arguments from the uh, instantiation, from all deployed arguments into the mangled name. And all call site specific arguments are already in template. So you see, we have a wrapper, we have a, a function that we wrapped, we even have a line number here. Uh, and the only problem that C++ code does not solve is mangling of constant string, like file name. Uh, C++ does not really support uh, string constants passed as known type uh, template parameters and does not have good mangling uh, for it. In fact, the only thing it puts in a mangled name is the length of the string. However, it's not a problem uh, really because this uh, uh, wrapper instantiation are used only locally. Uh, they are used only in the compile unit in the file uh, that we are currently compiling. And uh, they are usually just in line, uh, like only, only in case of pointer, they are not in line, but generation is simple. But we don't have one declaration, one definition rule in C, so it's not a problem if uh, multiple uh, compile units have. Uh, declaration with the same names. So uh, basically we don't need to separate uh, separate functions by the file name. Uh, 
We only need line, we only need wrapped function, and that's all already supported. Okay, so that's all for the for the implementation, but you may ask a question. Is this the only way it can be implemented or not? Have have we considered any alternatives? So one alternative was preprocessor macro, as Seren described on slide four, but the main problem is that preprocessor macro does not cause uh, does not know cost semantics and it may mistake a function with a structure field with the same name. And you also have to rename the original function, which may be problematic if you need uh, to have stable ABI for the modules. And so uh, we actually thought about another alternative that will be an instrumentation that lives outside of the compiler and does the code transformation before it is compiled. And that's actually not, not a bad solution. Uh, the main advantage in the, this approach will be that uh, it will be independent from the compiler. After the transformation, you can compile the code with Clang or even GCC. Uh, uh, but in our approach that I described in slide, uh, slide before, the only supported uh, compiler is now Clang. Unfortunately, we didn't implement GCC uh, support yet. But if uh, this uh, approach gains tractions, we might actually do it also. And, uh, but this, uh, this Clang tooling, this uh, code transformation is also not a perfect solution. It has its own flows, like you have to distribute this tool somehow. Will you put it as a binary in all the Linux distributions or you put it as source in the kernel? But if you write a solution based on Clang, on Clang tooling, you have to put either the whole LLVM or like uh, tell users to have LLVM uh, development package installed in the system. And it actually may uh, have a license that is incompatible with kernel. Uh, so, uh, and another problem with the solution that you have to implement everything pro, uh, by your own. You have to implement template instantiation. You have to implement name angling and all of this stuff that we just reused from C++ in our approach where we modified the compiler. Yes, our approach have, uh, has its own disadvantages. Uh, and uh, one of the disadvantages is that uh, what we currently implemented, the proof of concept, is not yet ready to be upstream. It needs a lot of cleanup. It needs uh, like uh, uh, check. Uh, like uh, I commented some assertions that it's in C++ code or something like that. So uh, there should be it should be re-implemented cleanly. Uh, but I'm open to any suggestions to the proposed design uh, or to the implementations. Uh, so. Feel free to ask any question. And I think that's all for me. Thank you. Um, okay, I mean, the wrappers that you are defining, why do you need them to be so generic other than convenience? Like, okay, my point is, it seems to me that a lot of the C++ um, Ocus Pocus here, <laughs> it's because you need those wrappers those static inline functions to be generic, basic, right? Like the arguments yes. and the template that you are using behind the Cortans are basically passing those arguments to to um, to whatever function you are wrapping. But mm -hmm. it's not the payload. It's not the payload in this case. This call side data counter pretty specific to the function that you are wrapping. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you actually I mean, may I, have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I am wondering is that. Maybe you could use like C macros on the wrapper definition side. Yes. Uh, then you could the still limitation. have like like clean call sites, right? And uh, you can maybe you will not need to use all those C plus plus compiler features defined to define the wrappers. So with with the generic uh, wrapper approach, basically. Let's say we have 10 different allocators, k malloc versions, which with different parameters, right? With one generic approach, we can basically use the same wrapper for all of them. If we changing, for example, one of the issues was this variable argument. If we are changing it to more like 
Okay, we have wrapper for five parameters, for three parameters, for four parameters. Yeah, I understand, but you have uh, variable arguments features in C macros, sure. like so VA arcs. Right. So I understand that in your case, on the wrapper definition side, it will be annoying to have to have to define one wrapper for every function you want to wrap, right? Like a lock or any other. So I was wondering if you use the C preprocessor on the wrapper definition side, so you don't have to manually define, you know, a wrapper per function you want to wrap. Maybe, maybe it will be enough, so you don't have to resort to C plus plus yeah, templates. I think as long as with the source code, with the minus kernel source code, we don't have to change the definitions of the functions much. So in this case, we are basically just adding like it's a cosine wrapper, um, um, and basically just the name of the wrapper. Right, uh, so on the right side, you can see like attribute, cosine wrapper and so on. So as long as we can keep the changes to the source code to the minimal like this, whatever happens in the cosine uh, wrapper definition, we can play uh, some tricks with, with macros or you know, some, some other ways. Uh, the goal is to keep the original code uh, as clean as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um... I have some, or some questions, actually, that are some comment and some questions uh, about that. I think that are if, I'm not sure that the, your uh, final, uh, what is it, the, uh, the fe uh, feature or uh, what you need to do, but uh, if you uh, uh, want to uh, make this, uh, what's it, one or uh, kernel uh, interface or something like that, uh, the, how do you, how do you think that the get that the result of the, of this uh, uh, profiling? If you uh, expose that the profiling, uh, so there how this information is exposed to the user space? Yes, right. Uh, we use procfs now basically, and when you read from the procfs, it basically says, okay, this many bytes, this bytes, this many calls were allocated at this location, the file module name, line number, and so on. Yeah, so In user space tools basically can monitor it. Uh, from time to time and based up regularly and see, you know, if, is there any allocation which causing growth? That would be a good uh, uh, good point to start uh, yeah. looking for leaks, for example. In that case, that are you, you don't need to uh, use that. Are, uh, one thing is uh, you don't need to use that are, are file name, uh, pass, or something like that because that it depends on our uh, compiling environment. So that are it better to use that are uh, symbol and uh, uh, what is it? Or the uh, symbol plus offset or something like that. Uh, that could, uh, because that the user space tool can uh, decode that. And uh, also, uh, you if you export that uh, those information uh, from the kernel, that is the kernel. Uh, what is it? Or the kernel developers know that uh, that will be exposed. In that case, that uh, you can uh, expand uh, expand that uh, your uh, the core site uh, function or something like that, so that are using using that are the macros uh, for each uh, was the allocator. It's better to understand uh, was it that better to get a more understanding uh, was a font uh, because that. Uh, if you, uh, for example, uh, this one uh, actually that can uh, we can make it a similar uh, feature uh, by using that the F trace, uh, the uh, trace event or something like mm -hmm. that. Sure. Uh, but uh, if you are uh, how I say that are embed that are uh, that's uh, the uh, feature inside of the kernel. Uh, instead of the using that uh, user space tools from uh, what's it that are your F trace or something like that, um, in that case that uh, that is a part of the the kernel feature, so that uh, you can uh, exp you you're uh, good to expand that the 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 current kernel code, I think uh, because that are in that case that the user can uh, not the user that the uh, developer, kernel developer, and the main maintainer uh, can uh, understand how it works. But uh, in a com with the uh, working with the, with the co compiler feature, uh, we uh, don't usually that the, the uh, what's the 
to understand how it works, uh, we need to know that the, how the, uh, the compiler works too. Uh, well, yeah. There's not much to know how compiler works because the call side, the trampoline code is also exposed in the source, the source code. So you can see exactly what's injected. Uh, then your but, question about uh, exposing symbols to the file name and so on. We wanted to uh, use a reader, like uh, human readable form so that you don't need to, uh, you know, okay, you, you got this information, you need to process with this tool, then, then go to another tool and kind of, you also need uh, the source image to, to convert those to actually use source code online. So we wanted something that's actually usable by the end user right away without going through additional hoops. Uh, that's about the interface that we came up with. Uh, implementation of F trace, yes, it's possible. It's less performant, and our one of our goals, and that has that has been uh, uh, discussed during LSFMM. One of, uh, of our goal is the minimum overhead, performance overhead, because we want to deploy this in the field. Uh, the issues that we are trying to solve with this is uh, some, let's say, weird uh, memory leak which happens once in a while in the fleet of you know millions of devices and um, you can't reproduce it locally. So you need to that additional information right there when it happens, right? Uh, for, for that to be deployable in the fleet, you need minimum overhead, performance overhead. That's why we are kind of trying to, uh, to generate everything at compile time. Uh, F-Trace would require you to, to have dynamically linking, at runtime linking this allocation tag to the, your call using the red IP or something like this. And that adds overhead, which we were trying to avoid, basically. Yeah. So uh, jumping back onto Jose's point about uh, basically dropping all the templates and making it like pure C code. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do that, and then kind of backtracking to the original problem that you're trying to solve, which is to track memory allocations, you already have an attribute called alloc size, which should be associated with every allocator function in, in the kernel. So combining the alloc size and the wrappers, it seems to me like you could basically write a compiler plugin and not have to change uh, the compiler itself to kind of implement all of this. Have you considered uh, that still, idea? Yeah. Uh, if we can generate, again, the, the main issue here, we, we need to generate not only the logic, but the data structure at every call site. If we can, do that uh, in, with, in a, in a yeah, plugin. I, think, I, I reckon you should be able to do that with uh, okay. with yeah, the. Yeah, if, so you're you're basically it if it works. Then. Yeah, you're you're basically using instead of the alloc size attribute, you're using the uh, call site wrap by attribute. So you 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 if you in in this kind of framework, mm -hmm. if you replace call site wrap by with alloc size, and uh, you extend it to uh, also like include wrapper information in there, you should be able to associate the, the two and uh, build it through a plugin instead of having to patch the compiler proper to do that. Okay, we, we can explore that. I'm not, again, I'm not uh, very familiar with those uh, compiler specific things. Probably Nick and Alexi will be in, in better position to, um, to reply to that, but we, we can explore that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm interested in uh, a new use case to annotate all core sites of uh, kernel lock functions. We have similar issue with lock contention. Sometimes we it's hard to know which lock or where is 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 holding or contending the locks. So there are lock contention trace point, which is it can be enabled in production environment. Mm -hmm. Not like uh, locked up, but the problem is that the the trace point has symbols for the logs. Right now, we are using the code text to figure out which log is is called from this bed. But ideally, we want to have symbols, kind of symbols for these log instances, mm -hmm. which uh, locked up trace points support already. So if we use this code site trampoline things can add some symbols for the locks. Like uh, if we can use pre-processor me 
macro approach, we can symbolize the argument of preprocessors, like adding hash signs. Yeah, if you if you have access to original images, then you can understand that symbols. And yeah, with, with call side call side tagging, you can also do that. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm not sure this is possible with this approach. Right. Basically, uh, you will wrap uh, a different structure with uh, so alloc tagging that we are doing here. Alloc tag is basically uh, counters plus a code tag, which represents yeah, yeah. positions of code. So in your case, it will be code tag mm -hmm. plus your mm -hmm. structure, which includes uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the symbol for the for the lock. Uh, so yeah, it, it is possible. Cool. Um, just to be clear, I was not suggesting to basically drop in all this and go back to a pure macro implementation. Yeah, yeah, no, My point was that the, the attribute call site wrap by is on the point, but it's on yeah. all this dynamic right aspect I, of the of the wrapper itself that maybe it could be used macros for. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, like it's not only used for wrapping like uh, for generic functions for generic arguments. It's also used to deduce this file and line. If you, for example, you have instead of call side wrap by wrapper, call side wrap by some macro, then this macro will only have file and line from this macro, but it will not have file and line information or any call side information because it was basically implemented uh, by passing call side information through template parameters to the wrapper. So template and wrapper parameters are also used to pass call site information, which is not possible with macro. So one thing, I, I've been a bit confused up until I think some of the comments you made just in the last moment. Is that Hello? Yeah. Sorry. So I was going to say, I've been a bit confused throughout the presentation because you said really early on that one of the things you didn't want to do is like change the change all the code in the call site, right? But we already do that for a bunch of things today. Like, for example, whether we're not using KASAN, we go and rewrite a bunch of the things like the wrappers for all of the string ops and so on. I think one of the things you said later on indicated actually there's a, there's a slight difference here, which is that it sounds like this is not necessarily a thing you're going to use for everything upstream, but it's like you want to hack in at the last moment with minimal invasive changes. Is that a correct assessment of this? No, this is something you want to upstream. So what what I mean is that you said like you wanted to use this in your fleet because you're trying to diagnose one thing. Like so is it's it not one... necessarily that the the actual site that you're hack you want to add the trace point in would always have the trace point information you want in there. That's something you want to add in at the last moment. Is that maybe maybe I'll read the uh, I think maybe I can reword what you're kind of trying to ask it. Yes, I think something is like for K Malik, they want their upstream and never touch, put in, boom, 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 and with the least uh, invasiveness in there, but it sounds like what you're saying is, say if I it was last minute, I'm like, hey, like the scheduler is having an issue. I just want to throw something in there. It may not be upstreamable, but I could just slap a simple tag right there. Boom! I get the same functionality of everything. Is that kind of like what you're saying? Sorry, I'm just trying to look at if that's the argument or the justification for why we can't go and change all the call sites because we go and change all the call sites today in a bunch of other cases, and it's much simpler to to have all of that like with a slightly different name in the the real implementation. A header file that wraps that with C macros, whatever. But also, you can if you need to pass additional information, you can go and pass that in like registers and so on. Whereas these wrappers, because they've got the same prototype for the wrapper and the real call site, they can't pass additional information. They can have to store it somewhere globally. Mm. That's what they're doing with the static variables. I mean, so that's why it's like templates of punching out copies of these functions where they all have static variables to restore them. So. Yeah. Sure. Whereas like, I, I think a lot of cases where you where you want the course where you may want the call site information for something upstream, actually really want to pass that like an implicit argument mm -hmm. rather than have some global variable that you have to go and shove it in, and then the caller has to go and extract that out. So I feel like you know when I close my eyes and think of like what's the prior art here, um, I can't help but think of Fortify and like passing along the object size or the built-in object size as like an implicit parameter where we have all these calls to mem copy and no one wants to rewrite. 10 million calls the mem copy to pass two additional parameters for like what's the size of the source and the destination. Yep. So instead, we have all this complex machinery to implicitly pass additional parameters. So I'm kind of curious because I feel like this is incredible that you got this working. I am slightly horrified at like the C++ templates in C aspect. I'm amazed. I'm congrats. Okay. <laughs> Next part. Can we 
like, can we pass the func the file inline information along as arguments and like have always inline or something like that where like, I think, I, like I think, the thing I'm very nervous, like I also like your final slide where you said, we have this third idea for the tooling approach. I would encourage you to play with that as well because you don't need to ask for permission from any compiler vendor. This, you're gonna have to ask for com permission from compiler vendors and uh-oh. Uh yeah, sorry, one, it just, one. It just means we have to implement it right, right? Yeah, yeah, so one other thing on that front is that if you, if this is passed through a wrapper as an additional argument, that you can make that work with existing tool chains, yeah. which means that if you get it upstream, it works everywhere yeah. today, not on new version of tool chain, half the world doesn't have it for five years, et cetera. Um, so I was, I was thinking, uh, yeah, the problem with passing uh, file and line as argument is that we uh, will have one static variable like we want to clone static variables for every file and every line and like this is this saying is that a, you pass a pointer to that code tag as an argument you instantiate that pointer. per call for a macro you call, in your call okay. site in your real presentation you have that as an argument okay that, this that, this is a good idea actually but uh the like yeah i see so uh, I was thinking of a slightly different approach and let, let me know why this was, doesn't work. Uh, but uh, like outside of the compiler, like if you just take the VM Linux binary, you have the, you have line information and all that already in that. And from the binary itself, you know what all the call sites are. So in theory, you could process the whole binary, build a table and link that along with the existing binary. Um, and then, you know, that, that table would have all the call side information. And then you do what Steve uh, was suggesting, which is mm -hmm. once you know all the call sites, you can then, uh, you know, patch them in the, like after the kernel boots, patch them and have them jump to the trampoline. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you can, uh, and then later, you, you don't have the line information at that point, but later you can, Take those counters and make sense out of them with the VM Linux dwarf. Sure, if you have access yeah. to VM. So it actually just reminded me one thing that came up that was a feature request from LSFFMM was that like sometimes you uh, boot up and you like want to find your memory leaks or whatever, and then like okay, I found it, got the information, I don't want to reboot the machine. Boom, just turn it off by actually call patching all the sites again back to the normal function calls. So it was actually one of the things to say where well, we could do a live, not just turn it on, but because they said you, you, a lot of this stuff needs to be recorded from boot up, but to be able to turn it off once you got enough information and then you're back full 100% in performance. Yeah, and, and the other advantage of this is you don't have any extra instructions and there's no overhead, uh, there's no wrappers, no macros, no compiler support. Uh, yeah, it's just, it just feels like it's more, like people who don't care about this stuff will have the same, you know, binary as before, and then. It, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so call time tram trampoline was that idea. Yeah. We just thought that having uh, compile, basically using compilers to do that, and re replace, basically removing the dependency on additional tools, which would need to go and uh, do the system yeah. would be. Um, more advantageous. And I mean, just yeah, additional tools, but like I said, if the compiler people don't do it, we have stuff like Obj tool and stuff like that that actually just goes through and we'll do it for you. Yeah. So we'll write an external tool that analyzes the code and say, okay, we'll create the own trampolines and, uh, you know, separately and everything else and just link it in. I mean, that's so basically we could link in a table of all the call sites, link in the trampolines for all the call sites into like the VM Linux. And then when you boot up, you say, oh, here's all the call sites, patch them, to jump to the trampoline. So then we need to generate also those structures, right? Which uh, we don't yes. know beforehand how many of them we need to generate because we don't know how many call sites are there. Well, no, it's, it's I mean, the tool will actually generate it. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, you need to parse a lot of dwarf information to make this work, to understand which part of the code uh, <laughs> attached to which part of the of machine code. Yeah, if, yeah, I, I just say that there, uh, if we, uh, uh, what are you, uh, start from the x86, right, uh, we can use the object tool yeah. uh, to find that the core, uh, core site. 
So you're familiar with Fops tool, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, saying if you basically, if this is one of the things I was thinking about, if you had the information, if you were able to make a template or something, start off with a template, pass it to like an Ops tool type of utility that goes in, finds all the call sites, give you a, a section with all the call sites saying, here's where you have to patch. And maybe with information about, and for with that, another table which actually has, you know, uh, tramp, like takes the template, converts it to like the trampoline that you would have, go through all the information that would add information that, and then link that, it will compile it separately and then link it all in. And then boot up, you could do all the patching and whatever. Or you yeah, can you can basically patch. limit all the changes to the compiler just to this attribute, which uh, assigns something like put something in the machine code that will be used by separate tool to patch this. Yeah, sure. It's more, less intrusive think, to the compiler. I was going to say, I think generating all those trampolines and patching them, that's not going to end up working on ARM64 because of branch range limitations and all the usual fun we have with that. We need something explicit at compile time mm. before you have the object. Mm. We, we, we can do a load of things, but I think there are options that we, a lot of options that we can do with, with existing compiler support. And there's, there's like a very, one thing that we can do today is if the cost of actually looking up the call, the caller um, can be a little bit, can be high on this. We can go look at the return address, go and index into a table, binary search, et cetera. Now that's obviously expensive, but we can limit, we, there are things that we can do to make that faster. And if the whole thing is, I want to have a, a single binary that just works all the time, and this is off by default, and it runs fast. And when we enable, and we can enable it and disable it. We, we can do things like that relatively easily today. Mm, the the goal is to have it running in the fleet because we don't know when the problem happens, when we, when we need to turn okay. it on, right? Okay. So, and which point? Why do you need the trampoline? It's just you're always passing it. Sorry, to, to yeah. Stephen's point, not to you. <laughs> right, but uh, the, then uh, your suggestion to use like indexing would, would uh, be not as performant as generating it at compile time. Sure, but then my other suggestion of you pass the thing as an implicit argument is going to be better anyway, yeah. right? But explicit arguments will not initiate a separate static variable for you. Could you expand on that, Alexei? Uh, yes, uh, like uh, uh, when we pass file and line as a template argument, there will be separate se static uh, variables for each call site. Sure, but imagine you have, imagine you have in a, in a header, a static always in line function. Within that function, you go and create this in the same way because you have access to that information. You put okay. that into a static variable which is scoped within that function. Mm -hmm. You take a pointer to that variable and you pass that as an extra parameter to the real function invocation. Gen mm -hmm. Generating the code to get the address of that is really simple. On ARM64, that's an ADR or an, eight, or an ADRP plus add. Plus putting that in a register is really cheap. Now the callee has that immediately. So it can do whatever it wants to it. Or if you want to manipulate that in the trampoline, you can do that. But you can do that with existing compiler support. The, the painful bit is the, the two things relative to this is the callee has to have a different name. I don't think that is a big deal because we have many cases today of wrappers with that naming scheme. And we have idioms that we could use and expand. And the other thing, yeah, it's a bit painful to write those wrappers, but we already know how to do that. I think the macro expansion um, examples of nesting that you mentioned, yeah, that is painful, but we already have that problem today with our existing scheme. It's been by memory. This is going to get knacked by other people. <laughs> <laughs> so about the name, they always in line and maybe weak, simple. I mean, I'm tr I'm thinking about the naming thing, right? So if you so replacing the names, you mean? No, I mean the yeah, I mean the per call site data storage, which is a static, but you need one per call site. I think the always in line that will give that to you, I guess, right? And um, 
But then now the problem is the naming of the function. You still need to rename the original ones, right? In that case. Yeah. Yeah. If you do all of this in the same compilation unit, you cannot use like weak symbols or some dirty trick like that, right? Like you provide your own definition of foo, mm -hmm. which is your wrapper. No. Yeah, then it's very similar to what we had with macros, yeah. basically. Um, yeah, the, the biggest uh, pushback was on those, those renames, basically, that well, we have to rename so many things. What I would really recommend is that if you go the compiler support way, um, don't make it in a way that you require C compilers to actually compiled, you know, parts of C++ in order to implement it. Yeah, no, because we understand that this is hacked. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Created just for pure uh, pro pro concept. Um, and we know that we need to make a solution. But every with Nick is very impressive that you got it working. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to ask, because I'm a little bit confused by the feedback from the MM folk about renaming a bunch of things, because they already have a set of existing wrappers for memory allocation functions that pass the caller in a few places. So was the I don't understand. Was the complaint that we were adding this to many more places, or it went deeper in the call chain, or, or what? Because I'm I'm struggling to understand why this is substantially different from what already exists. Why the macro approach is substantially different to yeah, that I existing think approach. It's sheer number of renames. Okay, but why did we have to rename so many additional places? Is that because the, we, no, we only because have we have lots of allocators. Just slab allocator has like. Okay, my understanding was a bunch of those already had macro wrappers. So I'm so may, maybe it's that's only a set, a small subset of the ones that exist, and you're expanding it to more. And I've just missed that, or or Joel is going to correct me. But but it's also not like future proof, right? Like now you have new use cases. Again, you need more macros and renaming and all that. So it, it might work for KMLOC, but. You sure. Know. What do you do when you you have a new use case and you want to wrap something that's already wrapped? No, I, I Which mean, order do the two no, wrappers that, that's run? That's fine. But if you see the use cases list, right? He had many use cases. This is not the only use case. It's not. It's not only for memory management. So, I mean, we we can add additional um, different use cases, and it we implement this as frameworks that other people can use for other use cases. As I said, the only generic part is code tag, which identifies the code. But you can wrap it into different structures which represent different things. Like sure, and, and I have use cases for a similar mechanism, which is not listed on this slide. I, but I, I think that some of those things, like dynamic fault injection, speed really should not matter. That's but true. I think that one is better served but by it's, existing it's really mechanisms. Easy. Once you have like uh, memory profiling, but it's really it's easy, easy today to using F trace, which with with oh, like with Rex, which we already have. So uh, no, well, F trace, as I said, performance issues. Not not for fault injection. Okay, so I'm just saying without fault injection. <laughs> oh, for fault injection, yeah. If you if you are interested just in that, sure. So I I feel like uh, because there's there's this impression that the toolchain community has rejected this. I I, I feel like I, I should probably elaborate a little bit more. Uh, in that, it seems like the first pass POC that will actually work and solve this immediate problem is write a plugin that works either with Clang or GCC, whichever, doesn't matter, and, and does all of this without the C++ tricks. Once you get that working, uh, plug in with the alloc size attribute, we can then make that into a general attribute, something like wrapped by, which then both compilers can agree to, and we can actually build a general feature based on that. Like Nick mentioned, you could, you could even write the uh, fortify wrappers in in a similar way. Right now, we have nine functions. That, so yeah, if you go the, the, the uh, stage, the whole thing. To me, if you go the uh, like a plugins way. It's even it's even better to write this, just to separate two for code transformation. Uh, so it will be it will work exactly the same as a plugin, but it will be a separate tool, and you don't need a special compiler version to plug into it. So I think it's better just if. Uh, instead of plugging just to use this alternative. And as Nick said, it's really need to be explored in detail. So the reason why I mentioned plugins is specifically to stage it for the compilers to actually 
uh, get it in in future. That's one. And second, because the kernel already has plugins uh, within wow. its kind of repository and its framework. So it, it would be something that you would be adding into uh, the kernel and probably maintaining alongside it. So that, that probably becomes something that's maintainable in the long term instead of something that you do today and then like forget about in, in a while or, or it's something that you kind of end up maintaining downstream. I think we don't have Clang plugin support in kernel. I think Nick will may uh, say something about it. Yeah, but I think the suggestion is is not that we do do a plugin for the sake of doing plugin. It is implement try implementing this as a plugin because if you do that, it demonstrates that the impact on GCC is small. It demonstrates it's possible. It, okay. it, it allows us to use it for a while before there is support upstream, and then that gives pressure to the GCC folk and clan folk to go and implement it. Okay. Okay. Now I understand. Sure. But I, I think Sadesh's point was there is a style of implementation that would be preferred. It's already possible with plugins. If it's possible, to, if you can do that with a plugin, it demonstrates it's nice and self-contained and so on. To repeat, so you don't have to touch random bits. You, you basically prove that you don't have to touch random bits to get this working. And that becomes it, and that makes it much easier to get into GCC. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll be the same for Clang as well, uh, where you can prove that it, it has a small enough pr footprint and at the same time is, uh, is a useful feature to have. Okay, generally. So, so sounds like. The yeah, the, the containment is a very big problem of this uh, solution because it spreads a lot, across a lot of if cases and patches a lot of places, it's not self-contained. And it's definitely a point for improvement. So next step is basically implement this plugin for POC and test that approach. Nick. <laughs> Nag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's still in Nag. <laughs> No, I, I, I won't promise ACK, but I can, I can promise looking at it uh, closely. Generally, it's helpful to have some way to insert a wrapper in the beginning here. Sure. Like, it'll definitely be generally useful to programs outside the kernel, I think, to wrap any call, right? For sure, yes. That's, right. that's why I, I, I improved my stand from write a plugin to start with the plugin and then we can build on to something that's more general because the plugin is going to solve the immediate problem as well which is tracking memory allocations because we already have an attribute to do that and Again, you just have to they're going to want to use that. this stuff for other things other than memory tracking right right at that point we can actually start talking about it uh, about a new attribute that that builds on that and it's going to be an incremental process at that point, which is I don't see how a plugin like people have to prototype with stuff, whether they do it in a plugin or a fork in a patch to show that it's possible, it really doesn't make a difference. Yeah, I, I think the key bit of feedback ignore plugin versus not plugin. I think the key sure. bit of feedback is this needs to be demonstrated in a much simpler way to start off with. Yeah. Right? That that's, that's, that. yeah, that's was, a fair way to put it. Plugin was a, yeah, for example. And yeah. I think the, the reason plugin kept on being said is that we have GCC plugins in the kernel tree today. That has been used to prototype a bunch of features, demonstrate kernel side, that yeah, yeah, we can been, actually use yeah. it if it's implemented this way. Then that has gone and influenced GCC community and client community to actually implement that feature. So I think the suggestion for plugin is not the, that that is what the route we want to go finally, but that's a, a mechanism to actually get it into a state where we can experiment with it and demonstrate this is actually useful without requiring everyone to go and build a whole new tool chain, which for a bunch of people is, is, is a lot more painful than building a plugin. I know. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to move this along so we can get on the bus. Yeah, but I think we're, I mean, you don't need a concession for me. I will continue to enact Clang plugin support in the kernel. Okay. Um, yeah. One more thing before we leave. Uh, if you think, if you can think about some other applications other than what I presented or uh, please reach out and let us know, and we'll be happy to provide, hopefully, provide a solution for that. I think. Sorry? Oversight, Troy, TV. Oversight.
Trace events. Oh, trace events. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you.